you everyone for coming out. I'm so excited to talk about my favorite topics, microorganisms. Can everyone in the back hear me? All right. So let's imagine that you discover some forms of life with some truly amazing capabilities. Some of the organisms you find can breathe in toxic metals and breathe out non-toxic versions. Others can live in water that is more acidic than battery acid. It sounds like I'm talking about aliens on a different planet, but what I'm describing are microbes that live here on Earth with us. So these are organisms that are too small to see, but they have amazing capabilities and they shape our everyday lives. So that's what I'll be talking about today. Now we can't see microorganisms, but they surround us and they are the most numerous organisms on our planet. So what this diagram shows is a tree of life. Each branch represents a group of organisms with a unique evolutionary history. And branches that are closer together are organisms that are more similar to each other. And the reason I'm showing you this picture is because all of the macroscopic organisms, the ones we can see with our naked eye, are here in this tiny little green branch at the end. Most living things on Earth are microscopic, and they have been around far longer than we have. So uh, microscopic organisms have been evolving for about three and a half billion years. And that's an amount of time so big, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. So one analogy is we can compress the whole history of our planet, which is 4.6 billion years old, into a single hour. And if we do this, so the Earth's crust forms about one second into that hour, the first bacteria, the first microorganisms, show up around 18 minutes later. And it isn't until 40 minutes into that hour that the first multicellular organisms evolve. Humans, in this analogy, have been around for about one millisecond. So microorganisms have been on this planet for an almost unimaginably long, long time. And when I talk about microbes, what that word basically means is any organism too small to see with the eye but it describes many different kinds of organisms with very different ecologies. So we can roughly divide microorganisms into two groups, those that have very simple cells with no internal structure and those with more complicated cells. So our simple-celled uh, microorganisms, most common are the bacteria. When people talk about germs, what they usually mean is bacteria. And again, these organisms are fairly simple structures. They can look like rods or little balls. And their relatives, the archaea, look very similar under the microscope, but in fact are constructed of completely different proteins. And these two groups of microorganisms are the ones that have been on our planet for billions and billions of years. Now, how many of you have eaten a mushroom before? A lot of people, right? So a mushroom is a kind of fungus. And a mushroom is one that is macroscopic. You can see it with your eye. But most fungi are microbes. They are invisible. So if we look at them under the microscope, their cells sort of look like little strands of spaghetti. And they live in soil, on the, um, in the bodies of animals, all different environments. And finally, there's a group of microbes called the protists. These are also single-celled organisms like paramecia and amoeba with complicated internal structures like fungi. And I don't want to neglect the viruses. Some scientists debate whether these microbes are alive. They're just a little piece of genetic information inside a protein coat, and they can't reproduce themselves without attacking a larger organism a plant or an animal or even a bacterium. So these are the organisms that we share our planet with. But what I want to talk to you about today is how these organisms that are invisible affect our lives and our society. So I'm going to start by talking about the role of microbes in big historical events. Then I'll talk about the microbes in your body. It turns out that in this room right now, there are way more microbial cells than people cells. And finally, I'm going to end up by talking about microbes in our natural environments and what they do for us. 
So huge historical events called epidemics are periods in history when many, many people die of the same disease. And these epidemics are caused by microbes that invade human bodies. Now for most of human history, we did not know that diseases were caused by microorganisms. But people have always kept track of these events in history books and in pictures like the one here, recording the movement of these microbes through human populations. And one of the most devastating epidemics in human history was the Black Plague. This was a disease that began in Asia and spread through Europe about 700 years ago. And it caused widespread death and destruction. We know about it because it was recorded in paintings like this one, in literature, in songs, and in uh, the diaries of people living through it at the time. So the scale of the plague is really difficult to wrap your mind around today. What I'm showing you is a graph of the population of Europe from the year 1000 to 1700. And generally the population was growing except for these two major interruptions in 1350 and in 1650. And those were the years when the Black Plague broke out. And during the first plague epidemic, roughly one in three people died of the plague. So this was a massive change in the size of the population in Europe. It spurred many economic and social changes as well. And the reason so many people died in the plague is because it was an incredibly virulent disease. So there were three forms, all caused by the same organism, but it depended which part of your body it infected. So the most common form of the plague, the bubonic plague, if you contracted it, you had a one in two chance of surviving. If the plague affected your lungs, you only had a 10% chance of survival. And if the plague infected your bloodstream, you were almost guaranteed to die of this disease. So you can see how serious this problem was. Now at the time, people did not understand that microbes caused disease because they couldn't see microbes. We hadn't invented the technology to look at them under the microscope. Many doctors were afraid of treating people who were sick because the plague was so deadly. Some people with very little medical training posed as plague doctors and they would charge incredibly high prices to provide their cures. So these people wore uniforms basically that looked like this, long coats and gloves to protect themselves against any bodily fluids. They wore these strange masks that had beaks in them where they would put herbs and spices and other things they believed would reduce transmission of the plague. And without an understanding that microbes were causing the disease, the cures these plague doctors came up with probably did more harm than good. So one cure was to apply leeches to people. The idea was that the leeches would suck out their infected blood. That was unpleasant and did nothing. Um, another cure was to get people to smell really caustic liquids like vinegar or ammonia, the theory being that this would drive the illness from their body. Again, not very effective. Some people eschewed medical treatment altogether because they thought the plague was God's way of punishing them for sins they have committed. So they attempted to do penances, to apologize to God, thinking that he would remove the plague from their bodies if they were sufficiently sorry for their sins. This was not a good way to treat the plague either. Because the cause of this disease was something that was unknown to people at the time. It was a microbe a bacterium called Yersinia pestis. And this microbe still lives with us today. The difference is now we understand that this microbe causes the disease, and so in the rare cases that people are infected, we can treat them with antibiotics and they will recover. Another reason the plague is not so common is because our modern lifestyle interrupts its transmission cycle. So the actual host of the plague bacterium is the rat. That is the organism where the plague likes to hang out. Most people in the Middle Ages did not keep very clean homes. They had rats, and those rats had fleas. The fleas would bite the rats, then they would bite the people, and that would transmit the bacteria and allow them to become sick. So I'd be willing to wager that most of you do not have rat and flea infested homes, and that's another reason why the plague is uncommon today. 
So the plague really changed the economy of Europe, but there is actually an event where microbes had an even bigger impact, I would argue, on human history, and that is the Columbian Exchange. This is the period of time when Europeans first made contact with the people living in the Americas. Now during this period of time, many goods were exchanged between the continents. For instance, how many of you associate tomatoes with Italian food? It's pretty typical pizza, pasta, right? Well, the tomato didn't make it to Italy until the 1600s. It's actually native to the Americas. The same thing is true for bananas, but in reverse. If you buy bananas, they were probably grown in Central America, um, but they were introduced there from uh, uh, Southern Europe and Africa during the Columbian Exchange. But what was even more consequential than these crops moving around was the way that microbes moved among the continents at this time in history. So, just prior to the Columbian Exchange, there were many incredibly advanced civilizations in several Central and South America. So you've probably heard about some of them in your history books, the Aztec and the Inca and the Maya. These people built incredibly sophisticated cities and temple systems. They were really expert astronomers. They knew a lot about mathematics. And they developed methods of farming that are so effective, we still use them today. But there's a common misconception that the rest of North and South America were relatively lowly populated at this time. So we think of the Amazon, for instance, as an untouched wilderness. You even see this in documentary titles, the Amazon forest, the last wilderness. So unfortunately, this forest is being cut down at an alarming rate, but it is actually revealing things about the human history of this environment. So the pictures I'm showing you here are sites in the Amazon where the forest was cut down and it reveals these geometric patterns in the earth. These are remnants of towns and cities and farms of the people who lived in the Amazon forest prior to European contact. So we're sort of redrawing our map of the Amazon. In this graph here, all the red and yellow areas are areas of intensive agriculture, and each black dot is the remnant of a city or town in the Amazon. So the first European explorers who made contact noted that wherever they went in North or South America, there were thriving towns and cities. The next wave of explorers in the late 1600s and early 1700s reported that the area was uninhabited in large part. So something happened between the 1500s and 1700s, and what happened was the movement of microbes. So this graph here is showing you the population of Mexico from 1520, around the time of European contact, until 1800. And Mexico had a lot of people in it in 1520, around 22 million. And you can see this incredibly steep decline in the population that happened right after European contact. And this is because Europeans brought microbes with them, microbes that were novel to the immune system of people living in the Americas. So disease-causing organisms were exchanged both ways during the Columbian Exchange. Uh, for instance, from the Old World to, uh, for, from the Americas to the Old World uh, was brought syphilis. In the other direction, diseases like smallpox, measles, typhus were spread. Scientists still aren't sure why the diseases spread from Europe to the Americas were more numerous and severe than the other way around. It may have to do with the fact that many of these diseases on the left panel here are transmitted by animals. Um, and in Europe, people tended to live in closer contact with their livestock than they did in the New World. But regardless of the reason, whether it was a historical accident, uh, the diseases really devastated the populations in the Americas. So again, at the time, these people didn't know what was causing these huge uh, increases in mortality. But today we know that we, the answer is microbes. So microbes like variola virus, rickettsia, and vibrio bacteria. These are the causes of the diseases that decimated the population of the Americas. And because of this, in the 200 years between the first European contact and the arrival of these microbes, uh, and uh, around 200 to 300 years later, 
The population declined so drastically that the citizens of the Americas were unable to militarily resist European invaders. And so within a few hundred years, European countries controlled a lot of the territory in the New World. And this, of course, has had tremendous consequences for the way the history of this region of the world has developed. And again, this is all down to the exchange of microscopic organisms during this period of time. Now, in the Black Plague, during the Columbian Exchange, I've mentioned that people had no idea what was causing them to become sick. And the discovery that microbes were responsible for illness depended on this object, the dis invention of the microscope that allowed people for the first time to see the microorganisms that surround us. Before the invention of the microscope, people had some pretty wacky ideas about where diseases came from. So one common theory is that all disease states could be attributed to the balance of four fluids in your body. Uh, black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. So this is why treatments like applying leeches were so popular. People thought that you could literally get sick from having too much blood, which is something that's kind of silly to us now. Other people thought that diseases could literally be caused by bad smells. And so many treatments for disease involved moving people to environments where the air was thought to be better. This is called the miasma theory of disease, the idea that noxious air could cause illness. We began to arrive at the right answer that microbes cause disease with the work of Anthony von Leeuwenhoek and Robert Hooke in the 1600s. And these guys were the first to apply the invention of the microscope to look at the microorganisms that live in our natural environments and in our bodies. But it took another 200 years for people to put two and two together and come up with the idea that maybe some of these microscopic organisms could cause illness. And this idea was formulated by a scientist called Robert Koch. So he observed that if he looked at, let's say, mice, sick mice tended to have microbes living in certain tissues of their body, whereas healthy mice did not. So in his lab, he could actually grow these microorganisms from the sick mice on a petri dish. And the clincher is that if he took this microbial culture and injected it into a healthy mouse, that mouse would become sick as well. So really, it wasn't until the 1880s that we agreed that some microorganisms could cause illness, and that ushered in the era where we could appropriately treat disease through the use of antibiotics and proper preventative measures. So I've spent a fair bit of time talking about how microbes can hurt us, but I don't want you to leave here thinking that all microbes are bad. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of microbes either cause us no harm or are helpful. So for a long time, we thought that the only microbes in our, bod in our bodies were those that cause disease. Recently, just in the past 20 years, we've developed techniques to identify the microbes that are present in our bodies without needing to grow them in a lab. And when we do this, we realize that the human body is a home to an incredibly diverse community of microorganisms, most of which are beneficial to us. So many of you have probably seen a diagram like this in your textbooks. This is a map of the human body and some of its major organisms, organs, sorry. So the human body has about 10 trillion cells. That's a lot of cells. But what we're finding now is that for every cell in your body that belongs to you, there lives a microbial cell. So right now, every person in this room, no matter how healthy you are, you have about 10 trillion bacteria and fungi living in your body, which is an amazing discovery. And so again, some of these microbes can cause illness if they invade the body from outside or if there's an imbalance that allows some microbes to flourish at the expense of others. But we think that many of these trillions of microorganisms that are living in your body are actually contributing to its normal function. 
And not only that, but to a microbe, which is very, very tiny, your body represents basically a continent. So you have different species, different communities of microbes living in every part of your body. So in this graph, the pie charts are showing different types of bacteria that live in different environments in your body. So believe it or not, you have bacteria living on your hair. Those bacteria are different from the ones that live in your nostril. And those are different from the ones that live in your colon. Everywhere you go on your body is a different environment for a microorganism. And this has led to a lot of interest in what the heck are these microbes doing for us? So recently, just in the past few years, there has emerged a field called microbiome studies. The microbiome is the community of organisms that lives in and on your body. And scientists are trying to discover if it affects our overall health. So one way we can do this is by comparing the microbiomes of different groups of people. In this study, scientists were looking at on the right, the left adolescents and the right adults. And in each of those groups, they looked at people of um, average body weight and obese people. And in this example, they were looking at microbes in the intestine specifically. So the pie charts show the different kinds of microorganisms found in these people's guts. And the skinny blue line is showing the number of species overall. So we can see two things. First of all, people of a healthy body weight tend to have more species of microbes in their intestines than do the overweight people. And the species of microbes that are there are different too. So this has led to a lot of research, for instance, on whether um, the gut communities of overweight people differ in systematic ways from those of healthy weight people. So for instance, we know a group of bacteria called actinomyces are more common in the uh, guts of people who are overweight. Oscillospora are more common in the guts of people of normal weight. Now we don't know cause or effect. Does the environment of the healthy person's intestine favor the growth of some bacteria? Or are the bacteria causing us to metabolize our food in different ways? This is a really critical question, right? So one way we can study this is by looking at pairs of twins. Twins have, if they're identical, the same genetic information, the same DNA. If they're non-identical, they still share a lot of their DNA. So scientists have looked at the uh, bacteria that live in the intestines of twins, and the first thing they found is identical twins have more similar microbes in their intestines than non-identical twins. So there does seem to be some genetic aspect. Our bodies are determining which microbes end up in our guts. But what's even more informative is scientists look for pairs of identical twins in which one twin is overweight and the other is not. And in this case, the leaner twin always tends to have more of a type of gut bacteria called Christenselenaceae, which is a mouthful. I'm showing you a little picture of it up there. So is the Christenselenaceae helping the leaner twin maintain a lower body mass index? We can't do an experiment on people, but we can do an experiment on mice. So scientists have worked very hard to raise mice in the lab that have no bacteria in their guts at all. And then they feed some of these mice the Christensenella bacteria and give others different bacteria. Then the mice are fed the exact same diets. And the mice that get the Christensenella gain less weight eating the same food as the other mice. So this suggests that in this case, this bacteria is somehow affecting the metabolism of the mice in ways that cause it to gain less weight. In other words, if it's after Christmas and you have a little extra holiday weight, don't blame it on the cookies, blame it on your gut bacteria because they could be doing something. All right, so this raises the question of where do your gut microbes come from in the first place? So babies in the womb are completely sterile. They don't have any microbes living in their guts yet. The babies uh, gain their gut bacteria at the moment they enter the world. And it turns out that the way babies are born influences what microbes end up in their guts. 
So babies that are born vaginally versus C-section have different gut bacteria. It also matters what the babies eat in their first few months of life. So breastfed and bottle-fed babies develop different kinds of microbes in their gut. There's not enough data yet to say that some of these gut bacteria communities are better than others. They're just different. And it all comes down to those first few minutes of life when babies are exposed to microbes for the first time. Now people also ask, can you change your gut microbiota? And I bet many of you have. So how many of you have taken an antibiotic? All right, if you've taken an antibiotic, what does it do? It kills bacteria. So it changes the bacteria in your gut. So in this study, these little cartoons are showing the different types of bacteria that live in your intestine, first before taking an antibiotic, and second after taking one round of antibiotic. And when this happens, often we get an overgrowth of a certain type of bad bacteria called C. difficile in the gut. So the red bars are showing how many C. difficile you have. One round of antibiotic, that goes up. So then to deal with that problem, we take more and more antibiotics, and those consistently reduce the number of species of microbes living in your intestine. And this tends to have bad effects on human health. So we need to be really careful with antibiotics because not only can they cure disease, but they can imbalance your natural gut flora. So one solution to this, instead of giving people increasing rounds of antibiotics, is to do what's called a fecal transplant. And I'm afraid to tell you that is exactly what it sounds like. So we take some feces from a healthy person with a good gut microflora, and we transplant it to the gut of a person who's recently taken a heavy duty course of antibiotics. And that allows the natural gut flora to be reestablished. Now this sounds a little bit gross, but it is actually a better method of reestablishing those healthy, diverse gut communities than it is to take many rounds of antibiotics in a row. And hopefully we can come up with a way of doing it someday with a pill or something more pleasant. All right, I've talked a lot about the bacteria in our guts, but there are bacteria living all over your body. So one cool example that I like is a group of researchers looked at the bacteria living on our skin. And what they found is you have different species of bacteria living on every single fingertip, represented by these little colors here. So each one of your fingertips is a whole different world for the bacteria on it. Not only that, the researchers didn't stop there. So they went to look at the keyboards of people and they looked to see if the microbes that are living on your fingertips are the same ones found on your keyboard, and they are. So most people strike the shift key with their pinky. So the pinky bacteria, yep, they show up on the shift key. The bacteria on your thumbs show up on the space bar, which most people press with their thumbs. So when you are interacting with the world, you're not only leaving behind fingerprints, but you're leaving behind microbial fingerprints that are unique to you. So who knows if we'll ever come up with a way to use this to identify people at a crime scene, for instance. <laughs> All right, so your body is a microbe wonderland. We've talked about the many, many species of microbes that are living in and on you. But what about the natural environment? So the thing about microbes is there is no part of this planet that is free of microbial life. They are in the soils of forests. We can find them in the deep ocean. They live on top of snow. Even places like hot springs or hydrothermal vents, there are microbes there. Microbes inhabit every single corner of our planet. And microbes inhabit your refrigerator. So this is an environment a lot of people care about. If you enjoy bread, fermented beverages, cheese, preserved meats, preserved fruits and vegetables, you are benefiting from microbes in your environment. Now most people, when they think of microbes in relation to food, they're thinking of the bad guys. So if you've gone to slice some bread and it's moldy, that means microbes have beaten you to the punch. That mold is actually a microscopic fungus that's having such a great time eating that bread. 
it grows enough that it becomes visible. Farmers are always fighting microbes that infect their crops. So just like we get diseases, so do plants. I'm showing you diseases of raspberry and grape here that are again caused by microbes. And if you've gotten food poisoning, that's another encounter with a bad microbe. But the role of microbes in our food supply, I'd argue, is on balance positive. So if you bake bread, for instance, you know that a really important step after you mix the ingredients together is letting the dough rise. So it seems like it's magic. You put the ingredients together, you have your dough, you let it sit around, and it kind of expands and becomes fluffier. And that's what is, makes bread pleasant to eat and not a cracker, right? So it turns out that microbes are really important for the flavor profile of a lot of foods that we like to eat. Most foods contain a simple sugar called glucose, and microbes love to eat glucose. And when they eat it, their bodies produce waste, just like our bodies do. Now sometimes the waste that they produce is carbon dioxide. That is a gas that's what makes your dough rise. It's actually being inflated by this gas produced by microbes. CO2 is also what makes beer bubbly, for instance. Some microbes eat glucose, and as a waste product, they produce ethanol. That's what makes beer and wine alcoholic. Other microbes eat glucose, and they produce lactic acid. And that's what turns milk into cheese or yogurt. Also, if you like uh, fermented soy products, like soy sauce or miso, that's lactic acid too. So who is making all of these byproducts? It's microbes. Good microbes that live in our food and make it tastier for us. So the microbes that make CO2 and alcohol are yeast, a type of fungus that consists of a single cell. I'm showing you a picture under the microscope. Lactobacillus is a bacteria that uh, lives in milk and turns it into yogurt and cheese. So if you buy a yogurt, you can look at the side. It will often say live lactobacillus cultures. It's talking about that microbe that lives in it. My favorite one is aspergillus. This is a type of fungus that uh, is involved in the fermentation of soy products, and it looks super cool under the microscope like a little flower. So all of these microbes are responsible for making our food tastier. How many people here like cheese? All right, yeah. Cheese is great. And it turns out we have microbes to thank for that too. So all cheese starts out the same, right? It comes from milk. So then why does brie and stilton and cheddar and all of these different kinds of cheese taste different from each other? It's because they have different kinds of microbes. So in this graph here, each little skinny bar is a different kind of cheese, and the colors on the bar show the abundance of different species of bacteria and fungi living in it. So what differentiates the taste of one delicious cheese from the other is what kinds of microbes are there. They provide the flavor and the magic that makes cheese delicious. So microbes in our food environment, we have a lot to thank them for. Another place where we can encounter lots of microbes is in our natural environments, so in our forests and grasslands. So if you have ever walked through a forest, you know that when a tree falls to the ground, that log doesn't stay there forever. It eventually breaks down so that the nutrients inside it can be recycled and help the other trees grow. And this recycling only takes place because of microbes that live in the soil and help break down dead living things. So if you look at a rotting log, for instance, you'll probably notice that many of them have mushrooms growing out. And those mushrooms are just the tip of the microbial iceberg. So I said at the beginning, most fungi are invisible to us, even though a few like these mushrooms you can see with the naked eye. So if you could shrink yourself down to microbe size and zoom in on that rotting log, you would see that the whole thing is just filled with bacteria and fungi and they're secreting enzymes from their bodies that break down the wood and recycle the nutrients to the rest of the forest. So we talked about how many species of microbes live in our guts, but that is small potatoes 
compared to the number of microbes that live in dirt and recycle nutrients there. So in the summer, if you go into your back garden and you scoop up one teaspoonful of dirt, I promise you that that spoonful is going to have more microorganisms in it than there are people on this planet. And that's just a little teaspoon. And in there you're going to find a couple hundred species of fungi and probably a couple thousand species of bacteria. All of these bacteria and fungi are working together to recycle nutrients through the soil. So many scientists, myself included, would contend that soil is actually the most diverse environment on Earth. And this matters to us because the soil is also important for our survival due to its role in human agriculture. So this is a picture of a common site on a farm. This combine is going through. It's spraying fertilizer on the plants. Crops need fertilizer to grow, right? But that fertilizer, if it applies too much, can escape into the environment. It can pollute rivers and streams. Adding fertilizer is also expensive for the farmer and time consuming. So there's a movement in agriculture today to rely less on added fertilizers and more on the beneficial microbes that already live in the ground. So one of my favorite microbes that lives in soil is something called a nitrogen fixing bacteria. They live in the roots of plants and they have a superpower. So every time you breathe in air, air is 70% nitrogen, nitrogen gas. We breathe it in all the time. These microbes can convert that gas directly into nitrogen fertilizer for the plant. They're about the only organisms on the planet that can do this. And so these plants have little powerhouses of fertilizers living right in their roots all the time. Now, not all plants can do this. So the plants that have these nitrogen-fixing bacteria in their roots are those in the pea family, what we call legumes. So this summer, if you grow a garden, I want you to go into the back, and if you grow peas or beans, anything that produces seeds in a pod, you can dig that up and look at its roots, and what you should see are these little round structures that we call nodules. And these nodules are houses for nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Each one is containing several million of these bacteria that are busy converting the air into fertilizer at no cost to you. So that's a totally amazing microbe um, that farmers actually do already take advantage of. They often grow legumes in their fields in the off season to add nitrogen back to the soil. Another really cool group of helper microbes in the soil is the mycorrhizal fungi. So this picture shows a tiny little pine tree seedling. It's just emerged. And all of that white stuff in the ground is not the root. There's actually very few roots in this picture. Most of that white stuff is fungi. And those fungi, they attach to the roots of the plant and they are absorbing water and nutrients from the soil and feeding it to the plant. So we call the relationship between these type of fungi, the mycorrhizal fungi and the plant, a mutualism. So the plant is making sugars and photosynthesis and feeding them to the fungus. And the fungus is absorbing nutrients from the soil and feeding them to the plant. So they both benefit. And you can actually see this, you can do experiments, I've done these myself, where you grow the same plant, this is the same kind of plant on the left and the right, in soils without any fungi in them and with the mycorrhizae. And so the poor plant on the left, there's no mycorrhizae for it to partner with. You could see that it's small, it's kind of spindly, its leaves are yellow. It can't absorb enough nutrients on its own. The plant on the right has been grown with mycorrhizal fungi, and so it's able to take advantage of all the nutrients and water in the soil and grow big. So some of our farming practices actually negatively impact mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. And an area of interest for farmers is figuring out methods of maintaining their soils in a healthy state so that these fungi are around to help the farmer's crops. But in the natural world, we're learning exciting new things about mycorrhizae all the time. And one of them is that these fungi form underground highways. So in this picture, 
the gray is indicating the roots of the plants below ground, and all of those red lines are representing the fungi, and what they're doing is connecting the root systems of plants to each other. So underground in a forest, there is this highway of fungi whose bodies are shaped like long tubes, and they're distributing nutrients and other resources to the whole forest and keeping it healthy. So this is something that we're continuing to learn more and more about. All right. So over the past uh, 40 minutes or so, we've learned about the microbes that live in our bodies and in our natural environments. And what I hope you take from this is the fact that microbes really dominate our planet. They're the most abundant organisms, the most diverse, they've been evolving the longest. And even though we can't see them, every bite of food we eat, every breath we take, every time we digest, we have microbes to thank for making all that possible for us. And so I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. What's your question? What'd you say? Of microbes where? Oh, that's a great question. So the question was, how many species of microbes are there? And we don't know the answer to that. We can extrapolate from measurements we take, but we think that there are millions and millions and millions, way more than all of the species of plants and all of the animals added together. It's a really good question. Yes? The question is, would I advise taking probiotics? Research shows that taking probiotic pills doesn't actually seem to affect your gut microbes that much. What does is feeding the microbes you already have, and what your gut microbes love to eat is fiber. The more fiber you have in your diet, the more diverse and happy your gut microbes are. So that's probably the best way to keep your gut healthy. Good question. Yeah? Okay, so I'm wondering if I were to move these uh, microbes that were on my fingers into my gut, what would be the reaction if we were those Great question. So the question is, what if you moved microbes from one part of your body to the other, like from your fingers to your gut? Well, the microbes that live in your gut are used to a really strange environment. There's all sorts of acids being secreted in the process of digestion. So probably the ones from your fingers couldn't survive in your gut and vice versa. And that's why we have such different microbes on different parts of our body. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, if a woman had a C-section, does that change the microbe her baby has? Yes. So uh, the method of delivery, whether it's uh, the usual way or through C-section, influences which microbes and from what part of the body the baby encounters first, and it affects the gut microbes for the, that child's whole life. Yeah. Yeah, all the way in the back. Do the microbes explain our skin color? No, they don't. That comes from our genes, actually. But good question. They can affect many other things about us. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, what percent of all living organisms do microbes take up? As a fraction of the total species on Earth, the estimate is around 90% of species are microbes. So most of them. Yeah. So breastfeeding versus bottle feeding does change the microbes in an infant's gut, but we don't know yet uh, if those affect the infant's health, basically. So someone asked a question that I thought was interesting. What about the weight of microbes? So the weight of all the microbes in the world added together is greater than ours by about 100 times. All right, yeah. Oh, 
Oh, so the question is, how are microbes evol able to evolve to suit environments like the acidic gut? Well, given billions of years, microbes have found an evolutionary solution to every environment on Earth, whether that's a super acidic environment, a very salty environment, um, an extremely high temperature environment. So just given enough time for mutations, microbes can adapt to pretty much anything. Yes? question is, how are microbes made? That's a very profound question, a good question. So microbes were the first organisms to evolve on Earth. So scientists think that somehow the first genetic material got encapsulated in a very simple cell wall, and that became the first living thing. But we still don't know exactly how the first life on Earth came to be. Good question. Yeah? Okay, so do you believe that So the question is, where did tardigrades or water bears come from? Yeah. So they evolved like every other species, but probably why you're asking is their super cool ability to form in a little cyst and even survive outer space, right? Yeah? Do you think they came from outer space? <laughs> do I think they came from outer space? No, because their genetic code that allows them to do that is very similar to the genetic code of all other organisms on Earth. But good question. Can any of them switch places around in your body? Well, usually the microbes that live on your skin like to hang out in that environment. The ones in your nose like to hang out in that environment. So they don't like to move around. They sort of like the environment where they are. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a microbes that what? In lights. So the question is, are there microbes in light? So if you mean like, the, like just sitting on the lamp or drifting through the air? Yeah, so there are microbes drifting through the air, a lot of them actually. And they're kind of raining down from the air on us all the time. So not only do you have microbes living in your body, but you have microbes landing on you just from the air. Yeah. If a microbe, oh, if you uh, like take a shower or wash, will the microbes come off? So the microbes that live on the outside of your body, on your skin, some of them stick on there really well, but others can be washed off. And that's why it's important to wash your hands to prevent getting the flu, for instance, because you can wash those microbes off if you wash your hands really well. Good question. How did microbes evolve to suit which environment they're in? That's a great question too. So we can picture a microbial cell, it has some genetic information, and maybe there's a small mutation in that genetic information that makes that microbe just a little bit better at living in a hot environment. So if the environment gets hotter, that microbe reproduces more and all of its children also survive the hot environment a little bit more. And that cycle happening for millions and millions of years eventually produces a microbe that can live in very hot conditions. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah. You. Oh, do microbes have colors? Do, are microbes colored? That is a great question. As a matter of fact, some microbes are colored and you can see them outside. We grew microbes on petri dishes and when you get enough and you can see them, they're like hot pink and yellow and orange and all sorts of colors. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a difference between microbes and germs? No, germ is just a word that people use for microbes that's, um, you know, just a little nonspecific. Yes, and back there. Where is it that microbes get their energy from? It depends on the kind of microbe. Many of them in the same way that we do by breaking down other food sources and absorbing that into their bodies. Some, like plants, can get their energy from the sun. Yes? What's the 
biggest microbe ever found? The biggest microbe ever found. I believe I read something, so some single-celled organisms at the bottom of the ocean, they're only one cell, but they're actually macroscopic, so you kind of can see them. So that's a pretty big microbe. It's not even a microbe anymore. <laughs> yes? Um, if you were to gather up all the microbes on Earth, how big would the mass be? If you could gather all the microbes on Earth and add it up, how big would the mass be? It would be a lot. It weighs about 100 times more than all of the animals on Earth added up together. So a really big amount. Yeah? So what are the differences between microbes on like your forehead versus on your fingers? Difference between forehead microbes and finger microbes. They might not be that different because it's all sort of skin on the outside of your body. Yes? So um, those theories of mitochondria originated from a microbe in baby cells. Is there any other so the question was, the mitochondria in our cells that give our cells energy, we think they were microbes that invaded our cells billions of years ago. The same situation occurred with the structure in the plant cell that allows it to perform photosynthesis. It was a microbe that invaded the plant cell. Yes? What's the deadliest microbe? What's the deadliest microbe? That's a good, to humans? I think it is probably the black plague, scientists think. Um, or maybe rabies. Rabies is a virus that is, you know, if you get rabies and you don't have the shot, you're pretty much a goner. Yeah? Is it true that um, keyboards are like some of the most dirty environments from microbial standpoint? Is it true that keyboards are the dirtiest environments from a microbial standpoint? I would say the dirtiest environment is dirt because you get the most microbes there. Um, but people's keyboards are pretty filthy because they're actually not cleaned as often as like toilet seats are, which actually don't have that many microbes on them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Up there in the back. Oh, such a good question. How fast do microbes evolve in relation to humans? So evolution happens from generation to generation. So for a human, a generation is about 30 years. For microbes, you can have generation to generation in a couple hours. So way, way, way faster. Good question. Yeah? Uh, him, then you. You can yell. Why are different microbes different shapes? That's a good question too. It's just how they evolve to adapt their environment. So some microbes are shaped to stick together if they need to be in clumps. Other microbes are shaped so that they can move around. It just depends. All right, last question, and then I'm happy to take questions individually up here. So a few years ago, they had said that uh, the evolution of superbugs was faster than our ability to deal with it with antibiotics. Are we still at that pace? Yes, the situation with antibiotic resistance is only growing worse. Microbes, you know, they've evolved to like live in battery acid. They can certainly evolve resistance to the antibiotics we use. So discovery of new classes of antibiotics is one of the most important challenges facing the scientific community. All right, everyone, thank you so much for your questions. I'm happy to answer more up here.